Good morning. My name is Jana Carson. I am a volunteer here in Hope Kids, and I'm in a college group. Please stand for today's reading. Our passage today is from Galatians 6, verses 1 through 10. Brothers, if, any is, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Ah, you guys are looking great this morning. So glad you're here. Grab your Bibles, your devices, and let's jump into our study together today back in the book of Galatians. Next week, our last Sunday in Galatians. And so today, we will look at chapter 6, starting with verse 1. And we will start with the last two verses of chapter 5 in just a moment. But I have called today just one more thing. And so when I begin to look at this... Paul is writing this letter to the, Corinth, uh, to the Galatian churches and he uh, somehow throws at us at the very end of this teaching in this letter what I call a bunch of proverbs, these practical outworkings of the gospel. And, he's, and it's like he's saying, hey, you know, listen to everything I've said. Oh, wait a minute. There's something I forgot. Let me kind of share that with you for a moment. And then he says, don't forget if someone falls in faith, here is what you to do as a Christian. Watch out that you don't fall yourself and then carry one another's burdens. Don't think of yourself too highly or too low, he says. Care for those that teach you to partner with them. What you sow, you're going to reap at some point. Don't get tired in doing good. Take care of those in the faith community around you. And lastly, treat each other as brothers, is what he says. Now, the way Paul writes and teaches He writes in this form of that of an indicative and an imperative. Now, let me explain it to you for a moment if you don't understand that. That, first of all, the indicative is the statement when Paul writes about the gospel and what the gospel means to you and I and how that Christ came on the cross, gave himself for us, and that there's nothing that you and I can do to earn God's favor. So that's the indicative that he talks to us about what God has done in the gospel. And then the imperative is, once we hear the gospel, how do we respond to the gospel? That's the imperative. And remember, Paul is writing to Christians so that He's not writing, well, when you hear the gospel, that's one place to respond, yes, is you respond by that of coming to Christ. But he's talking about how do you respond to these words that you don't earn anything, God has already freely given this to you, so what do you do in response to that understanding? Because here's the thought. If we just get the indicative part down, right, or the imperative part down, if we just get the doing part down and we don't have a real good understanding of the indicative, that of why the gospel is sent and how God works through the gospel, then it's all about works for you and I. It is. It's all about you, I earn, us earning something. So it's about what I do creates this greater relationship with God and then God accepts me in a greater way. And so what Paul says, just a minute, I'm going to spend five chapters with you. Five long chapters with you talking to you about the indicatives, talking to you about the gospel and what the gospel means and how that God has worked through the gospel in your life. But then when I get to chapter six, I'm going to give you some imperatives because I want you to have a good foundation. Five chapters. I want you to have a really good foundation before I talk to you about how you respond. Because if you go out without this good foundation, then it's going to become legalism for you. And so I begin to think, you know, of the teaching this morning, how could I sum this up into one sentence? 
And you say, Mark, can you really sum what you say in 45 minutes to us every Sunday in one sentence? And if you can do that, then why is it so long, right? Well, just don't confuse me with the facts for a moment, okay? But listen, here is the sentence, and it sort of goes like this. Lord, as you have been to me, I will, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, be to others. Think about that for a minute. Because this is what Paul is teaching us. Lord, as you have been to me, I will, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, be to others. So look at chapter 5 and verse 25 for a moment. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Underline that. We talked about that a little bit last week. Let us not become conceited. And then he takes this word conceited and he breaks it down for you and I. He says, and look how it's grammatically formed, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So here's the first of a couple of thoughts is this. The Spirit leads us into a gospel-based self-image. This is important that we understand ourselves, that how we should be seeing ourselves before we can do the things that Paul is going to ask us to do in chapter 6. So we have gone through our teaching and we understand that we walk by the Spirit, that when we come to Christ, that the Holy Spirit is resident within us, that we are led by the Spirit, that he facilitates heart change. It's not just a behavioral, a behavioral uh, modification for us, but he changes our heart. And then he says, we crucify the flesh. That's our part. That's what we do in all of this. We deny the desires of our flesh. We crucify the flesh. Then we live by the Spirit, that the Spirit refocuses my life and your life. And then the last, he says, that we keep in step with the Spirit, that the Spirit directs us or redirects us in life. But Paul says, let me warn you when you're doing all of these things. Let me give you a warning, he's saying, that you should guard against becoming provoking and en envious because those are the things that make up this word that he calls conceit. So let me talk to you about your self-image for a moment. Because I think when we find ourselves in this journey of doing all these things in the spirit that God has called us to do, that we can approach relationships with a superiority conflict complex and that means that we can other look at other people's lives and we can say man I am so glad my life is not as stinky as your life right because I'm much more moral and I'm much more ethical and I'm not involved in the sins that you're involved in so we look at it with a superiority complex but this can be a two-sided two coin because we can also approach relationships with this inferiority complex. And that is, I look at your life and your life is going well. And my life now is really stinky, right? And so I'm thinking, man, I, I resent your life. I resent what's going on in your life. And so there's two ways that I approach relation, relationships. And he said that those make up what he calls conceit. Well, well how, what does that mean? What is he talking about? Well, a better translation for the word conceit is that of empty glory. And so what that means is this is about me, is what it means. Whether I approach a relationship in life through this superiority complex or the inferiority complex, either way, it's about me and it's simply filling myself or trying to fill empty spots in my, in my life with the way I feel about you and the way I enter these relationships. And this is about you. And so what Paul is going to do in this next chapter, he's going to say that this is not about you. That the gospel refocuses us. It is the gospel that fills our life. It is the gospel that answers all those questions for you and I. It is the gospel that completes us. And so it refocuses on us. And he says, this is not about you or me. This is about others, is what he says. So Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And here we go. This is the journey. So hang on. Here it is. He said, brothers, if anyone... So remember, he's writing to Greeks and he's writing to Jews and he's writing to the Judaizers and he calls them all brothers. So this is not a question about whether they're saved or not. No, but he simply lumps them in one big group and then he adds somebody else to the group. He said, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, those of you that are keeping in step with the spirit, he says, should restore him to a spirit of, of gentleness Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. That we restore him in a spirit of gentleness, and we keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So here's the first thought. What happens to those who are caught in sin 
And what role do I play in their mess? Yeah, I chose the word mess. It's a great theological term, isn't it, right? Yes, because I think it, is, I think it really describes life. It really does. That what happens to those who are caught in sin and what role do I play in their mess? You see, Paul doesn't exclude those people that are caught in sin from the group of brethren. He lumps them all together. And I think that's important because what I draw from that is this Christian sin. They just don't need to stay in their sin. So understand that Christians do sin. We just don't need to stay in our sin. But this is not the group of people that we were talking about last week who continually ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit in their life and they're living in this open rebellion against God. But he's talking to people that are fighting the battle. We have said this before, that this is an inner battle, a conflict inside of you between that of your own nature and the spirit. So he's talking to those people that are fighting the battle against their own nature and the flesh. The question is not, are they saved or not? The question is, are you fighting the battle? Are you crucifying the flesh to stay in step with the spirit? And he comes and he starts with this thought about conceit. And he says, I want to center you for a moment. They were all fighting a battle. Every one of us in this room, no one, not one of you in this entire room is exempt from the reality that you are fighting a battle. If you are a follower of Christ, if you've had a redemptive experience with Jesus, then inside of you is still your own nature and inside of you is also the spirit and there is a battle between your own nature and the spirit this morning. So he simply levels the ground for you and I that in the spirit and in this relationship, the gospel levels this playing field so there's no room for superiority. There's no room for inferiority as well or conceit. It enables you and I to deal with each other as brothers and sisters, especially in this area where one of us finds ourselves caught in sin. So if you're keeping in step with the Spirit through the work of the gospel in your life, then how are you responding to those who have been overtaken by sin? He uses the word overtaken is what he does. And when I began to look at that word, what I realize is that that word actually means trap. That's what that word means. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these crazy things. But this thing can take your fingers off. That's why I am holding it like I'm holding it this morning, right? Because I do believe that God heals, but I don't want to give you an illustration on healing, correct? Right? Isn't that right? Yes. So... We will hold it like this, but the word means trap. Here's what it means. It means the moment in your life or your brother's life or your sister's life where they find themselves in a situation that they never thought they would be is what it is. So he's not talking to those that are living in open rebellion against God. No, no. And, and are they beyond God? No, that's not the point. But he's talking to those that are fighting the battle, but they find themselves trapped in a sin. And so I thought, well, how do I illustrate that? And I thought, well, this is your brother. You say, Mark, that's G.I. Joe, right? <laughs> this is going to be fun, isn't it? Yes. And so this is your brother, and you find your brother in a trap. Now, my greatest fear of this for first service was that the trap would close it would amputate both of his legs. He would fall on the floor in front of you and it would just, this sermon would be done, right? That would be it, yes. Yes, and then I told one of our, I told one of our staff members that and, and they said, well, all you do is just turn him over and stick his head down in there. I thought, wow, that's even worse. But it's a great idea. But I did bring G.I. Joe to help me today because I, know, I knew that Ken would not have the guts to do this, right? So I brought G.I. Joe with me. Think about it for a moment. <laughs> ah, that wasn't in my notes, but I just come up with that. I thought that was pretty original. Yes, I did. Yes. So here's the thought. You've, all, you've known someone in this situation, 
right? You've known a, another brother or sister in this situation. Then, then what is your responsibility? That's what Paul addresses. See, we have, we have already talked about the indicative of the gospel. We know what the gospel does in our life. Then the imperative is there is a responsibility you and I have for what we know. And that responsibility is the word restoration or to restore is what it is. And I looked up the word and it's a very powerful word because what it is, it's actually a term that's used in the medical field about simply setting a bone. And when a bone is broken, you set a bone and you return the bone back to its original state. It is simply bringing some functionality into a situation that's extremely dysfunctional. And so what he does in his teaching, Paul does, is he brings us to this place where he says, your responsibility, now that you know the gospel, and some of you have been here for like all 13 weeks of that, and this is week 14, so you know the gospel. Guess what? There is a responsibility that you now have for coming all those weeks. It is. And that is that when your brother is in the trap of sin or sisters in the trap of sin, you have a calling upon your life to restore them. Is what you have. Well, Mark, you know, that I'll, I'll let them know that I'm praying for them. And if they ever need me, then they can give me a call. And you know what? I would love to do a survey in here of how many of you have ever said, hey, I'm praying for you, and you never uttered one moment of prayer for that individual. Now, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, because you know, right? It's Christianese. It's our language. Hey, man, I'm praying for you. Really? Let's pray, pray right now. You know, I don't want to get that personal with anybody. So here's the thing. You say that, call me if you need me. You're walking away from them, praying to God that they never make that phone call, right? Why? Because you don't want to get in their mess. That's it. And Paul says, my call in life, your call in life, is to restore, to set back what's been broken. Can I even give you a better definition? It's the book of Mark, chapter 1, in verse 19. And here's what the gospel of Mark says. It says, and going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Say, Mark, what does that have to do with this? Because the word mending is the very same word that Paul uses for restore. And I think that's powerful that you and I are called to repair what's broken, but not just to fix what is broken, but to set in order what's broken so that it can accomplish the task that it was created for. So when I see my brother or my sister locked in the trap of sin, then my place is to restore them for the Holy Spirit to work through my life to restore them, not just so they can walk away or limp away from that moment in their life, but you restore them back to the original state so that God can use them for what they they were originally created to do and to be. Amen. And that's going to cost us something. And what that is going to cost us, that is going to cost you and I stepping in the middle of their lives. But how do I do that? Oh, perfect. I'm glad you asked that question because Paul answers that. He says, restore in a spirit of gentleness. That we restore in a spirit of gentleness. By that, in your notes, write the word humility. That I approach my brother or sister with great empathy and with great compassion. Why? Because I know and I realize that I am made out of the very same flesh that they're made out of. So I have the propensity to step in the same trap that they have stepped in in life. And when I do that, that levels the ground between that person and myself. And it causes me to approach them with this great effort and in and, and this great moment of gentleness. And that's achieved through what Paul says by saying, keep watch on yourself, lest you to be tempted. And what he's saying is this, that you have the same flesh ability and propensity to be in the same trap that they're in. And when you go to restore your brother, you go in that spirit is what he says. 
Because any righteousness that you have and any right standing that you have is not built upon your faithfulness. It is built upon God's faithfulness. Again, that is, that is the indicative of the gospel that what we know God does to the gospel. Now the imperative is I go to restore my brother when they are in this trap of sin and I do it with a spirit of gentleness because I keep in mind who I am. Wow, if I could pray for, well, I should say, when I pray for Hope Fellowship and what kind of church that we develop into over the years, this is the kind of church we need to be. That we need to be a messy place to realize that you cannot sanitize this place and it remain the church, that we are a messy place and we are called to step in the mess of other people's lives. So I wrote in my notes this week in my journal, if you want to know if a church is driven by legalism or the spirit, watch how they treat those who have sinned. Watch how they treat those who have sinned. And then he says in verse two, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor for which for each will have to bear his own load. So how do I keep the law of Christ perfectly, completely? You see, that was the goal of the Judaizers, wasn't it? We've talked about this now for how many chapters. That was their goal. That's what they were telling those that were not Jews. You got to become like a Jew. So you got to do this. You got to go through this ceremony and you got to keep the law perfect. If you're going to be a Christian, you've got to do that. And so what Paul is saying, hey, if you want to do that, I can tell you how to do it. I can exactly tell you how to do it. And that is bear one another's burdens. That's it. Bear one another's burdens. That's the way to fulfill the law of Christ perfectly. Is what he said, that you bear one another's burdens. Again, there is something that you and I need to do here. And when he writes verse 5, he says that for each will have to bear his own load. The word load and the word burden are not the same words. They actually sound like they should be the same word, but they're different words. Because here's the difference. Burden is the work of the flesh. That is the work of the flesh. That is the trap of sin that Paul talks about. The word load is your call from God to bear one another's burdens. It's God's call upon your life. That load is your responsibility and my responsibility. So we are to bear one another's burdens. This, this is that this is outward focus, not inward focus for you and I. And it's very simple command to obey. It is very simple. Look for a brother that is burdened, whether that's sin or whether that's a struggle in their life, a relationship problem, whatever it is, a broad brush, I understand it. But look for a brother or sister who is burdened and help them. That's it. Amazing, isn't it? To look for someone that has a burden and to help them. It's not complicated. The church doesn't have to come together and to create some kind of infrastructure for you to do this. It's not complicated at all. No, that this is the very simple thing that God is calling us to do. But yet it is in the simplicity of it all. It is very difficult for you and I to inject ourselves in other people's lives. We're afraid of being hurt. We're afraid of being vulnerable. We're, we're just afraid of being rejected, all kinds of things. And so Paul knows that. That's why this is a true work of the Spirit through your life this morning. He says in John 13, he said in, in verse 35, the, the writer says this. Let me give you a model about how to love then if you're struggling about how to love your neighbor. And he says, a new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That we love one another just as Christ has loved us. 
So this is a different kind of love, isn't it? This is something that Christ is modeling for you and I. This is more than me greeting you in the lobby and say, hey, man, I love you, right? And we do that. We do that. And I, and I think we mean that to each other. We really do. But yet he's modeling something very different because it's the model after how Christ has loved us. How did Christ love you and I? Sacrificially. How did Christ love you and I? He loved us to the point that he gave himself so that you and I would be restored. So what he's saying is this. This is a very sacrificial type of love. This is more than me seeing you in this kind of situation and saying to you, hey, man, I'm praying for you. I hate you're where you are, but I love you, dude. It's more than me saying to G.I. Joe, I love him, but it's saying, hey, man, I love you, and I'm going to do something about the mess that you're in, and I'm going to put myself in the middle of this situation, and I'm going to be an instrument of the Holy Spirit so that you will be restored. If you understand anything about the gospel, then this is your call. This is your call. If you've ever been wondering what's God called me to do, this is what God has called you to do. There's no doubt. But there's an alternative in our lives for not doing this. We talked about this a few weeks ago and it's Galatians 5, 14 and 15, and you can read that later on if you want. But Paul says, hey, if you're not loving each other like this, if you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not caring for each other to the point that you restore others, you don't ignore their sinful situations, then here's what's going to happen. If you don't do that, he says you will end up biting and devouring one another that you end up being a wild pack of animals is what he says outside of loving each other like Paul is challenging us to love one another. And then he says, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What prevents you and I from bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ and can I tell you, it's the P word. It's pride is what it is. Yep. Yep. You say, Mark, wait a minute. I have never thought I was better than anyone else. You know? And probably a lot of you in this room have not ever had that thought. Well, I'm just better than they are. You know? But pride doesn't always present itself like that. Many times pride presents itself by saying I'm more important than they are. So in light of my importance, I deserve more of my own attention and my own love. Nathan quoted C.S. Lewis, so I, 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 can I quote C.S. Lewis too this morning? And C.S. Lewis says this, and I love this about humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. You see what pride does? Pride puts a distance between you and I. Humility draws us close together. That I can't help my brother get out of this trap if there's pride in my life because pride is going to create a distance. Humility brings me close and humility is brought about in my life by the understanding of the gospel that I did nothing to earn where I am with God and I deserve nothing as far as God working within my life that I'm a broken sinner just like my friend who's caught in the trap and that humility draws me close to them. And pride pushes me away from them. But can I tell you this thing of pride is a, is a double-edged sword as well. He says that if you think you're something when you're nothing, that's a double-edged sword because for some of you, you have been this person here. You've been there. You've been the G.I. Joe. And, and, and somebody's come to you and said, hey, man, I see that you're really struggling in life and you're struggling with this thing that's going on here. And, and, and man, I want to help and I want to be part of your journey and I want to get you. And, and you say things to them like, listen, I'm fine. There's always someone in life worse than I am. Go help 
them. And can I tell you something in love? That is not your humility speaking. That is your pride. That's your pride. We just spin it so it sounds like it's our humility. And you don't know that because pride blinds you. So here's a thought. When Satan, Satan was evicted from heaven, why was he evicted from heaven? You say, oh, Mark, that's simple because of his rebellion. Well, what was the source of his rebellion? Pride. Why? He thought that he knew more than God, so he thought that he could kind of run things, right? And he found out that wasn't the way it worked. And so he was booted from heaven. But what does the devil do day in and day out? He works against the workings of God in this world, thinking that he still has a chance to win. What motivates the devil to think he still has a chance to win? It is what? Pride. It's pride. Always was his sin. Still is his sin. So pride blinds him, just as pride blinds you and I within your life. Can I tell you something this morning? That if you are struggling, if you are, you, you are here, you know that, you feel that, you understand. This is the way you feel, like there's a vice on you this morning and you're locked in some kind of trap do not let your pride stand in the way of restoration and help from your brothers and sisters. Allow people to reach you and to minister to you and to step into the mess of your life. So verse six says this, and this is where we kind of end everything this morning. Let the one who is taught, beside the word taught, Write the word catechism. For some of you, that connects you, doesn't it? Because you've been to catechism, so that's what he's talking about. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So here's the principle of sowing and reaping. And it's a huge principle. It's a broad, broad brush that we can paint. But I want to deal with it contextually in just a moment for you. And then we will pray. But he says, let the one who is taught the word, that's you, share all good things with the one who teaches, and that's me. I think it's interesting, isn't it? If you read Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians, he hates even writing about this. He would refuse to even preach and teach on this because it was such an uncomfortable moment to talk about that. And so I begin to think about that a lot. Why, why does Paul put this in here? Because what Paul says, hey, I've given you these indicatives. Now let me give you another very specific imperative. Let me give you a way that you can work this out. And it's that of the relationship that you have as the one that is taught with the one that teaches. He said, let me talk about that for a moment. Because I've talked to you about how you relate to each other. Now how you care for me and how I care for you. My relationship with you and your relationship with me is what he's talking about. It's interesting. And so I thought, what is he talking about? So he, talked, he uses the word share. Same word that we use for fellowship, the word koinonia. Same word. It talks about partnership. And so what he says is this. That between you and I, between the teacher and the one that's taught, between the pastor and the congregation, the minister and the congregation, is koinonia. It is a partnership that you and I partner together. We partner together financially and in service and in and, and compassion for others, vision for that of people becoming and belonging through loving God and loving others and making disciples, that we come together and we partner together to accomplish God's work in this world. 
is what we do. And I think we have place so much emphasis on, well, who's in spiritual authority and who's not and, and all those kinds of things. And, and we see that a lot in Christendom today where pastors elevate themselves and all these kinds of titles that we, we tend to take on and all these kinds of things. I think we've come so focused on spiritual authority in the church that we forgot that we are called to serve one another. And I think there has to be authority and there has to be leadership and we understand how that all works. But have we focused on all that so much that we have failed to serve one another? Because my call in my relationship toward you is to serve you and your call toward me is to serve me. In fact, Jesus gives us that example in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Last text for the morning. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, that's the right relationship between you and I. We talk a lot about the relationship between you and the person sitting next to you, but the relationship between you and I is that of one of service, that I serve you and you serve me. And we do all of this in the, in the hope and in the belief of restoring those that have found themselves in this trap of sin in this world, that the teacher or the student is not this passive pawn in this relationship and I'm not this domineering dictator that we serve each other in love. So let me finish with this concept of sowing and reaping. Because it's a broad brush, it is. And man, I could, we could talk about it in so many ways this morning. But when I look at it in context of what Paul is teaching us here, as we wind all this down and tie it all together, he's talking about what I sow into your life is definitely the focus of what he's saying. It's what I sow into you and you sow into me. And he's saying that, hey, when I'm sowing in the spirit into your life, when I'm stepping into your life, and when I am, am stepping into the mess of your life, that what I'm going to sow is going to be reaped back in that of the spirit. It's going to be reaped back in eternal things and eternal rewards. It's not that necessarily that I'm, you know, it's, it, this is not the, the prosperity type of gospel where I'm saying to you that if you give something in the offering today, then God's going to give it back to you many, many times over. That's not what we're talking about this moment. What we're talking about right now is the fact that what I sow into you, I'm going to reap back through the spirit and that of things that are eternal. And so if I want to see a good harvest in your life, then I have to be willing to sow into you that I can't just stand back and leave you here. That I have to be willing to sow good stuff into your life. You know what I've learned? I'm not a gardener, okay? I'll, I'll just tell you that right now. Reba would tell you that. I'm not a gardener. I can plant grass in my yard and I can grow that, right? But, I, I, but corn and other things. But what I do know about the principle of gardening is this, that you don't plant corn seed and expect to harvest tomatoes. Isn't that true? Am I right? Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a principle that works every time. So I can't expect to sow pride or a superiority complex or an inferiority complex or to ignore you when you are in this situation and for things to turn out okay in the end because it's my calling to sow into your life. He ends with this statement for you and I. And he says this, as we have opportunity, let us do good. And I thought about that a lot because of what I realize is there's a lot of brokenness in the world around us. And there's a lot of people that we know that are in this situation. And there's a lot of hurt and pain in the world. So I can't fix it all, right? And he says, as you have opportunity, and here's what he means, as you have opportunity with those 
around you, with the person sitting next to you, with the person behind you, in front of you this morning, that you have opportunity to sow into someone's life in the spirit to reap a harvest that is absolutely eternal. Because what I realize about the thing about gardening is that the harvest is always much more valuable than the seed that you put into ground. And so I realize that the harvest is great if I don't get weary in doing that. And that means that sometimes this kind of love is tough and challenging. It causes me to love you at a place of vulnerability in my life. It causes you to give me, to give you an element of my life that I can't replace, and that is time. It asks me to get my hands dirty when your life is dirty. It says that I just can't walk by you anymore and tell you I'm praying for you, seeing your feet locked in a trap that you cannot get out of. But I have an opportunity to do good and it's my call from God. You see, I don't believe we can call ourselves a Christian community unless this is the way we love each other. So how well are you loving and how well are you restoring this morning? Because that's the call on all of our lives as believers. So I will drink a glass of tea for a moment, a little bit, and then ask you to do something very different. Now, some of you that know me, that makes you nervous, doesn't it? because you're thinking you're going to have to say something absurd and ridiculous to the person sitting next to you. That's not it at all. It's worse than that. I'm actually going to challenge you to pray for each other this morning. You say, Mark, I don't even know the person's name sitting next to me. Well, let's start there for a moment and then we'll move forward, okay? And, And don't get nervous just just hang on for a moment. Lock the doors. Don't let anybody leave, okay? So just stay where you are. Because I know some of you thinking, Lord, if he would just close his eyes, I'm at that door, you know? So turn to the person next to you and could you ask them their name if you don't know their name? Could you do that for a moment? Yeah. Some husband just turned to their wife, okay? <laughs> now that's your mess, okay? And I'm gonna have to pray about getting in the middle of that one. I really am. So now you know each other. So would you stand with me for a moment, please? Have you noticed we've never been a church that puts you through spiritual calisthenics? Stand, clap, all those kinds of things. We don't do that a lot. Because we want this to be a a work of your heart. But I am going to ask you to do something else. And I know that some of you have an aversion to being touched and I understand that and if, and if that's your aversion then, then there's reasons for that and we respect that greatly but if, if you're comfortable could you just put your hand on, the, hand on the shoulder of the person next to you do you mind doing that for me if you're comfortable and you say Mark are we becoming that church just hang on hmm. I love it you guys are so wonderful I wish I could take all of you home for lunch uh, I really did but I can't and you know that person's name. Now let's make this a moment and a place of prayer. Pray for them. Call their name out before God and pray for them. And ask God how you can bear a burden in their life. Let it begin here. You know the gospel. You are called to do something about what you know today. And it begins now. So pray for them and pray how that you can bear a burden in their life. And if you know the burden in their life, 
pray for that burden and then have a conversation with them later today and how you can interject yourself in their life to make things better for them and restore them. So can we pray together? Father, today we pray for one another as your children. As the body of Christ, we come together and we pray for our brother and our sister on our left and on our right. We call them by name before you today, Father, that we are a faith family. And so, Father, whatever burden is in their life, whatever they are carrying today, that they were not designed to carry that alone. But God, you carry that, and many times you carry that through us. So, Father, let us not just be a keeper of the law, but allow us to be a carrier of burdens today for our neighbor. So, Father, we pray for our neighbor today. Whatever is happening in their life, whatever they're experiencing, whatever their struggles may be in this moment, God, we pray that you would, by the power of your spirit, minister to them. And Lord, today, that we submit ourselves to you to be used by you, Father, to be used by you in specifically their life, God, their life. So Lord, use us because we are brothers and sisters in this room and we are accountable to each other and we are accountable to you, Lord, for what we do with what we know. So God, help us today to be instruments of restoration in gentleness in the lives of those that we're praying for today, Father. Bless the one that we're praying for, Lord. Allow us to be a part of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, amen, amen. Let's sing together.
for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there so that more people have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.